In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, uh, the King James translation, the text says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now this same uh, verse out of the message translation, it reads, concentrate on doing your best for God. Work you won't be ashamed of, laying out the truth plain and simple. I like this translation because it says we are to concentrate on doing our best for God. As, as believers, as Christians, we have a responsibility to live our life in a way that is pleasing to God. We have a responsibility to walk before others as a witness of our faith and as a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that brings a, a, a good reputation or it reveals a good reputation of, of who we represent and that would be Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. The grace of God now should motivate us as believers to commit ourselves to living out this word. Let me say that again. The grace of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God should be enough to motivate us as believers to be committed to living out this word in our lives, whereby other people can, can see that there's something different about us. People should know that if we are, if we say we're Christians, if we say that we are uh, born again, believers, then people should be able to look at us and, and know that we're different, that something is different about us. Now, they may not understand what that might be, but they ought to be able to see a clear distinction between us and someone who, who is not saved, who, who has not given their life to Christ. Um, we ought to be intentional about avoiding spiritual immaturity. Let me say that again. We should and should without hesitation be intentional about avoiding spiritual immaturity. The Apostle Paul over in uh, Ephesians chapter four, verse one, he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Paul, he talks about being a prisoner of the Lord. And the reason he makes that statement is because he wrote this epistle from, from Rome under house arrest. Uh, at the time he wrote this letter, he had been a Christian for uh, 30 years. He has established uh, numerous churches. Uh, he has uh, healed people. He's cast out demons. He has uh, rebuked folks who were worshiping uh, Diana, uh, the false god. And, and he has uh, demonstrated uh, the work of Christ in the earth through his ministry. And now he's under house arrest because he has caused all type of havoc in terms of people losing their income, in terms of them serving false gods and and he this he's really at this point has uh, upset the the leaders and the, the Pharisees they're just like at their wits end with uh, Paul preaching the gospel and so now he's under house arrest in Rome in Acts 28 verse 16 where I'm about in there lets us know that he's under house arrest but he writes this uh, letter to the saints and he says, again, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He's instructing the saints to walk worthy of the vocation in which they are called. In other words, walk worthy of your calling. But then he says something over here in verse 14. He says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. And so he's writing to the church. He says, I want you to walk worthy of the vacation in which you've been called. 
he says you should no longer be children tossed to and fro by the, uh, the, the craftiness of men. He's telling them in essence, it, it's time for you to demonstrate the maturity of Christ and who you are as a child of God. Um, the United States uh, Census Bureau, they say that those born between 1980 and year 2000 are considered Generation Y, and the, the census says that they are currently right now the largest population on the face of the earth. But they coined this, 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 this word for this particular generation uh, to, I guess, reflect this particular generation, uh, to, to reflect Generation Y. And the word that they coined for this generation is adulting. Adulting. And it, it just simply means doing what adults are supposed to do, uh, taking on responsibilities that adults take on. Adulting. And I guess they coined this, this word for this particular generation, Generation Y, because what they discovered was that Generation Y, uh, age group between 1980s, those born between 1980 and the year 2000, they were extremely uh, uh, efficient in technology. Uh, they, 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 they know technology. Uh, they are geared to technology. Uh, this is a generation that don't, they don't write checks. They, they do apps. They, they do the money apps and whatever. They are highly sophisticated in technology. But what they discovered was, even though they are uh, highly efficient in technology, they were behind in terms of actually doing adult or taking on adult responsibilities. You know, uh, getting married, uh, getting a mortgage, uh, paying the rent, paying bills. In fact, uh, they said that a large a majority, a large amount of them, I shouldn't say majority, but a large number of them still stayed back at home uh, with their parents uh, longer than what their parents did. And so they coined this saying or this, uh, this word for this particular generation, adulting. And it simply means taking on adult responsibilities. This is what Paul is saying to the, the saints in this particular letter, he says, in essence, here in verse 14, he says, we should no longer be immature like children being tossed to and fro by every wind of new teaching. He says, we should not be influenced by people trying to trick us with their lies. He says, in essence, it's time for the church, if you will, to grow up and start doing spiritual adulting, if you will. And Paul says, in essence, he said we should be stable in the word of God. We should be stable in this word. If you've been saved longer than three years, uh, you should be pretty stable in this word. If you have been studying the word and and applying the word to your life, you should be pretty stable. Now, you know, I know all of us are at different stages in terms of our, our walk with God. And I know the text says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But if you've been at this thing for at least three years or longer, you should have some stability in terms of your walk. I mean, you take an a, 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 a infant, even in the natural, we know that if we have a child that's not walking by three, um, we're concerned. We know that something's not right. We know something is not going according to plan because, you know, you start walking, you know, before you reach the age of one, unless something is, is, is wrong for the most part. And so if you've been saved at least three years or longer, you, you should be pretty firm in the, the teaching of the gospel. And Paul says the enemy should not be able to trip us up. We should be stable in this word. And the only way for us to become stable in the word of God is for us to know the word of God for ourselves. It's important for us to study this word and to know this word 
for ourselves. Yes, I, I understand that we get uh, uh, teaching on Wednesday nights with Bible study. I know that we go to uh, Sunday morning service or, and, 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 or whenever you attend service and, and get the, the messages, but you still are responsible for studying this word for yourself and getting this word into your heart and to know this word for yourself so you can know whether or not what you're being taught, what is being said to you is actually accurate according to scripture. Paul says in verse 15, he says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Paul says we should be people of truth. As he says that we should be stable, he says we should be people of truth. He says we should all be moving in essence towards one direction and that direction should be Jesus Christ. Because there's only one way to get to truth and that truth is through Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth and the life. And so we should all be moving towards the truth and that truth is Jesus Christ. And we should be speaking the truth. Now, what that simply means is as a, a, a Christian, as a, 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 an adult Christian, as a mature Christian, I should be stable in this word and I should not be backing down from sharing the truth of the gospel. Now, one thing I know about truth and that is people don't like the truth. People don't like to hear the truth and sometimes people get offended when you tell them the truth. But we are to speak the truth to people especially when they asked us um, what we think about a situation or ask us to give input into a situation. We should not compromise the word. We should not water down the word. We should not try to go around the block to, to, to land the word in a, a, in, a, in a soft way. We should just speak the truth in love. Paul says in verse 16, he says, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Paul says not only should we be stable, not only should we be speaking the word of love, Paul says we should be doing our part as part of the body of Christ. He is saying in essence that each of us are so important to the body of Christ as members that it's important that we do our part for the kingdom of God. Now the issue here that Paul is talking about when he talks about uh, us doing our part as part of the body of Christ, he's really talking about unity. The whole issue is unity. Coming together as part of the body of Christ and I contribute something to uh, the kingdom, you contribute something to the kingdom, whatever that something is that God has anointed you to do or gifted you to do or given you the ability to do, you do your part, I do my part, and by doing my part and you by doing your part, everyone is blessed by our giftings and the, the, the church grows because we are working hand in hand in, in, in unity to see to it that everyone's needs are met. This is what Paul is talking about. Now, he describes here in this letter the difference between the lifestyle of the saved and the unsaved. And this is really good. This is really good because Paul lays out in the text what a lifestyle should be for those who are saved and what it's like for those who are unsaved. There's a clear distinction here, and he lays it out. And one of the first things Paul says here is in verse 17, he says, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Paul is saying, don't be like non-believers. Don't be like the culture. Don't live the way they live. I found out that when you don't live the way the culture lives and when you go around them, 
either they're going to be uncomfortable or you're going to be uncomfortable. Now, when I first gave my life to Christ and I used to go around the unsaved, I was uncomfortable. And the reason I was uncomfortable was because I had not yet matured to the confidence level in which I should have been walking in as a believer. I was a believer. I was a babe in Christ. And I just wasn't confident in my in my understanding of the word. I just wasn't confident in who I was as a as a as a Christian. And so when I went around um, uh, those who were uh, not saved, I was a little uneasy, especially those who knew me before I gave my life to Christ. I just was not comfortable because I was uneasy in my own uh, spirituality. I was uneasy in my own walk. But as I grew in the word, as I studied the word and start understanding the word and start understanding who I was in Christ Jesus and start embracing my identity as a born again believer, I became stronger and confident in my walk and I became stronger and confident and bold in my message in Christ Jesus. Now, I did not go around and, and condemn people and tell them they're going to hell and, you know, you're a sinner and you shouldn't be doing that and you shouldn't be doing that. No, I, I didn't do any of, that, any of that. And I still don't do the, any of that. I don't preach the gospel to people with my words, especially those who knew me before I gave my life to Christ. Because I have learned to be an illustrated sermon. And the way you become an illustrated sermon is that you live out this gospel before those who knew you before you gave your life to Christ. And when they look at your lifestyle and when they watch your conduct and when they see something different about you, that ministers to them. And make no mistake about it, they're watching you because you, you, you say you're this and they knew you before you said you was that. So now they want to see if there's any difference in your lifestyle. And when they see a difference in your lifestyle, it ministers to them. And so Paul is saying that as mature saints, we are to live differently than the world. He says, don't be like the culture. Now, Paul is implying here that as a Christian, we can get caught up in doing what everybody else is doing. This is what Paul is implying. He is implying that just because you're saved, just because you give your life to Christ does not mean that you can't get caught up in doing what everybody else is doing in the world. Paul says that those who are not born again, he says they're unfruitful in their minds. He says in verse 17, they walk in the vanity of their mind. And so what Paul is saying is that those who are not Saved those who have not given their life to Christ. He says, in essence, their thinking is wrong. He says, they think the way they think. They think the, in their own way, and that is in their intellectual pride. And that is true for those who don't know Christ and those who are educated and even those who don't have a form of education, they have their own way of thinking. They have their own reasoning. They have their own philosophy, if you will. And so they have their own intellectual pride. Their thinking is, is, is different or should be different from your thinking as a believer. Now, one of the, the biggest problems we have in the body of Christ is believers having uh, to, to deal with what's popular, you know, going along with the crowd and, and buying into what everybody else is doing because it's the cool thing to do and it's the popular thing to do. I am totally convinced that there are things that the, the world is doing that we should not have any part of whatsoever. We should not wear certain things. We should not say certain things. We should not advertise certain things. This is certain things that the culture is doing that they call popular. It is the way everybody's doing things. Uh, we should be different. There's some things we should just not engage in. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we can't you know, we got to live back in the 1880s. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just simply saying that we have to have a discernment as to what is appropriate for us as believers in terms of dress, in terms of communication, in terms of activities. We just have to have a spiritual discernment as to 
what would glorify God and what would not glorify God. And that's our responsibility. And that's one of the hardest things that is being played out now in the body of Christ, being able to discern what really is glorifying God and what doesn't glorify God, even though it's acceptable in the culture. He says, in essence, once we give our life to Christ, we should start the process of changing the way we think. Once you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, once you make that confession, the next step should be, okay, how do I now start changing my thought process whereby I'm, I'm thinking now more like a, a Christian as opposed to a non-Christian? Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the message translation, the text says, don't be so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. I love that translation. It says, don't be so well adjusted that you just flow without even thinking. Sometimes we get so adjusted to what's around us in terms of the culture that we just flow and we give no thought to what we're doing, what we're saying, where we're going. He's saying in essence here in Romans 12, be aware of what you really think and be aware of what God thinks. In verse 18, Paul says this in uh, Ephesians chapter four, he says, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Paul is saying that the unsaved are so far away from God because their hearts are not right towards God. This is what Paul is saying. Now, the, the second thing that Paul says here in terms of the unsaved, he says their life style and their decision making is based basically on how they feel. They live according to how they feel. He says in verse 19, the New Living Translation, they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Paul is saying they're motivated by their feelings and not by the word. They just kind of do what they feel. There's no limits, there's no boundaries. They just do what they want to do. We all have feelings. There's not a human being that doesn't have feelings. But now the difference between uh, someone who's saved and someone who's not saved, the person who's saved knows that their feelings now has to line up with the word of God. Just because I feel a certain way don't mean I act on that feeling. I have to sift that feeling through the word of God. My feelings must measure or be measured against truth. Your feelings as a believer must be measured against the truth. And so when you start feeling a certain way, there's another step that you have to take. And that step is where you allow your mind now to analyze what you're feeling so Satan don't get you all caught up in your feelings and deceive you through how you feel. So many Christians are being deceived based on how they feel. And we're not supposed to function on how we feel. And we know this teaching. We're supposed to function based on the word of God. It is the world. It's, they are the ones who function on how they feel. Anytime we feel a certain way and how we feel, if it doesn't line up with scripture, then that feeling is a lie, period. And I may feel it, but if how I feel, if I can't find it in the text, and if it goes against the teachings of the gospel, then how I feel is a lie. And I need to tell my flesh, you know what? You're lying to me right now. And I'm not buying into the lie. We're going to line up with the word of God. Now, Paul says, as Christians, we're different. Now, keep in mind, he's writing this letter from uh, house arrest. He's talking to the saints. And he wants them to know that, you know what? It's time for some spiritual adulting. And he's laying out the differences between the saved and the unsaved. And he's telling them now, here's how we to do this thing. Here's how we are to live as believers. He says in verse 20, NIV, he says, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. What way? By how you feel. By thinking any way you want to think. He says, you didn't come to know Christ that way. 
He says in verse 21, surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with truth that is in Jesus. He says, you were taught the truth about Jesus Christ. And he wants you to know that the truth is Christ. You want truth, you've got to find the truth in Christ. He says in verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Verse 23, he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24, he says, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, Paul is spelling out in this letter the difference between us as believers and those who are non-believers. He's saying in essence that we have to renew our minds in verse 23 and he says in verse 24 that we ought to put off the, the, the old man and put on the new man. He says we ought to take off the old and put on the new. Now, that's that's very uh, easy to understand because all of us remember the old man. And there's not a Christian listening to me tonight who cannot convert back to that old man. We can put on that old man at a drop of a, uh, a dime if we want to. We remember the conduct of the old man. We remember the conversation of the old man. We remember the pleasures of the old man. We know how to be that old, that old man, that old nature. But he says we ought to put on the new man put on Christ. And so what that simply means is that, and for most of us, we knew the old man longer than we know the new man. And so what I mean by that is we were unsaved longer than we've been saved. And so we are very much familiar with that old conduct, that old lifestyle, and we know how to flow in that old lifestyle. In fact, when you get around certain people, that old lifestyle tries to pop up. Or have you ever been in, uh, out at the mall or just going to the store and a song, a old song that you used to party on would come on on the uh, intercom and the next thing you know, you shopping and you dancing and you popping your hands. And the next thing you know, you catch yourself like, what, what, am, what, what am I doing here? And you don't get caught up. Why? Because that music is playing, that old nature starts going with that old music and you're not even thinking, man. That old man just automatically just kicks in. But he says we have to put on the new man. And every day we ought to put on a new man. That's what the Apostle Paul meant when he says, I die daily. And what Paul was saying was, every day when I get up, I kill the old Paul. And I put on a new Paul. And you and I ought to do the same thing. Every day when we get up, we ought to kill that old nature, put on Christ. It's like changing clothes. And literally, that's what it is. You put on Christ. Yes, you want to cuss. But no, you don't cuss. Yes, you, you, you really want to do something in the flesh to get back at folks, but you don't do it. You forgive them. You let it go. You just you bite your tongue. You let them go. You let it go. You let them go because you know that's the right thing to do. And so what are you doing? You're putting on the conduct of Christ. You're putting on that new nature. A soldier is just a normal person, a normal individual, until he puts on that uniform. But as soon as he puts on that uniform now, he's transformed from just a normal citizen into a United States military personnel. A, a judge is just a man or woman, just a civilian, like anyone else, until they put on that black robe. But now as soon as they put on that black robe, they are transformed from just a normal everyday citizen into a, a law uh, enforcer of the state, if you will. And that's the same thing with you and I. I'm Doug Thompson, this, this flesh. I'm this uh, uh, fleshy human being until I put on Christ. And once I put on Christ now, I become the righteousness of God. I become now the child of the most high God. And I remind everybody, I'm just not Doug Thompson anymore. I'm just not uh, the person you grew up with. I'm just not the person that uh, I, I, you party with years ago. I, I'm, I'm a new creature now in Christ Jesus. I'm, I'm God, the righteousness of God. I'm God's son. I'm his servant. And I have put on Christ. 
and we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is instructing us to take up the old and put on the new. He says in verse 24, put on the new self, if you will. And he's saying it's very important now that you and I wear the new man. And this is part of adulting, spiritual adulting. And that is simply you putting on Christ. What does that mean, Pastor Doug? It simply means that you put on the characteristics of Christ. You participate, you, you, uh, you conduct yourself according to scripture. In every situation, regardless of who you're dealing with, you conduct yourself according to scripture. And there are times you have to remind your flesh, you know what, that's not who I am. I'm saved because your spirit man is saved, but your flesh is not saved and your flesh is never going to get saved. And your flesh is always going to want to do what it wants to do. That's why the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And it takes as these two are contrary one to another, meaning that the flesh and the spirit are always bumping heads. They're always fighting. That's why you have this civil war going on inside of you. Some of you tonight have this civil war going on inside of you as I speak right now. You're, you have a craving for something that you know you should not participate in. That you know that you should not touch. But you've got this, this battle going on. Some of you right now have the battle going on in your mind about being angry with someone. And about forgiving someone who has hurt you, who has done you wrong. And you know you should forgive them. You know you should let it go. But your flesh is saying you can't let this go. Because you let this go, they're going to do this to you again. If you let this go, they're going to walk all over you. If you let this go, then they, they will have gotten a better hand over you or the upper hand over you. But your spirit man is telling you, you let that go. Leave it alone. And so you have this civil war going on right now. Some of you listening to me right now, you married couples, you are in battles and you've been in battles. Some of you have been entrenched for years. For years you've been entrenched. You've been in this battle against each other for years. You're trying to see who, which one's going to give in first and who's going to get the upper hand and, and, and you know, who, who, who's in control. And so you, you've been going on for years in this, this battle when you know what the word of God says. What is it that keeps us from doing the word of God when we know what we should do according to scripture, but we don't do it? What is that? What is that? It is the flesh. People say, well, it's pride. It's, it's the devil. No, it's not the devil. It is your flesh being empowered by you. It's as simple as that. It is your flesh being empowered by you. You're not demon possessed. I mean, if you're a child of God and got the spirit of God dwelling inside of you, the, the devil can't make you do anything. He's not controlling you. He's influencing you, but he's not controlling you. You are empowering your flesh to do what it wants to do. When you really should fire your flesh and employ your spirit, man. This is what Paul is saying. And he says, put on the new man. He's saying, in essence, fire that old nature. Employ the new nature. Allow your spirit, man, to get the upper hand. One of the things that you would notice when you see someone coming out of the federal penitentiary system, one of the very first things they want to do is get out of those prison clothes and get into some normal clothes. Now, question, why do they want to get out of the prison clothes and get into some normal clothes? How come they just want to go home in an orange jumpsuit? I mean, why, why do you got to change? Why, why is that the first thing you want to do? Well, they want to do that because they no longer want to be associated with the, with the prison system. They want nothing else to do with the prison system. They don't want the smell of the prison system on them. And so what they want to do is they want to get out of those prison clothes, get into some normal clothes, because now they want to step into a new normal. They want to step over into a new flow. Why is it that we give our life to Christ but we, we still want to stay back in these old grave, grave clothes, these clothes that belong to the world, these clothes that stink 
to high heaven of the flesh. Why is it that we don't want to change and put on that new man? Some of us. Now, in verse 25 to verse 32, Paul, in this letter to the saints, he identifies and gives us specific areas that we are to change in terms of how we act in the world. Which is powerful because now we don't have to figure it out. We don't have to scratch our head and say, okay, how are we supposed to act? Um, what should I do and what shouldn't I do? How should I handle myself as a Christian? You know, now that I'm born again, you know, how am I supposed to conduct myself? What should I do? You, you don't have to figure it out. I don't have to figure it out. All I have to do is read what Paul has written to the church and just do exactly what the Apostle Paul says do. He spells it out. He spells it out. He says, here is how you are to do this new spiritual adulting, is what he says. Oh, what he means, should I say. Verse 25, he says this. He says, wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor. He says, one of the things you are to do as a mature saint is speak the truth. You speak the truth. Now, why is he telling us to speak the truth? He's telling us to speak the truth because the reality is, if I'm going to help you become a better person, and if I'm going to help you with the gospel, if I'm going to help you with the teaching of Christ, then I have to be honest with you. I have to speak the truth. And Paul's dealing with a group of people who are around a culture where they were worshiping Diana, the sex god, they were uh, uh, living any kind of way. And Paul was saying, you have to tell them the truth. They might persecute you. They might not like you. They may not even want to hear the truth. But Paul is saying, you have to speak the truth. And some of you tonight, you're not speaking the truth. You have to speak the truth. When you become an adult in this thing, when you come to the place where you're maturing in the things of God, you have to speak the truth. Now, you speak the truth in love, but you still have to speak the truth. You have to tell people what is right in the eyes of God. You are a representative of the kingdom of God. And as an ambassador to the kingdom of God, you have the responsibility, I have the responsibility to speak on behalf of heaven. That's what an ambassador does. An ambassador goes over to other countries and represents the United States of America. They speak on behalf of the President of the United States. And when they speak on behalf of the President of the United States, they have to speak the truth. If they don't speak the truth on behalf of the President of the United States, they're going to get fired. You and I are ambassadors to Christ. We are ambassadors to heaven. We are speaking on behalf of God. And so when we speak on behalf of God, we have to tell the truth. If we don't tell the truth, we don't help anybody. If I'm sitting here in the midst of sinners and I know the truth and they're engaging, engaging me in a conversation and I have an opportunity to share with them the truth. And I don't give them the truth. I'm not helping them. I'm not helping them. If you don't speak the truth to your children, you're not helping your children. In fact, you don't love your children if you don't speak the truth to them. If you don't get in their face and tell them about themselves and let them know that they're going to bump their head. Or let them know that the lifestyle they're living is not of God. And do it without apologizing. Do it in love, but don't don't compromise the gospel because you are afraid of messing up that relationship or you don't want them not to like you. It, 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 as a parent, you ain't called to be liked. You call the lead. You're going to be held responsible for how you can handle that life that was under your uh, tutorage before God. And so as as children of God, we have a responsibility, Paul says, put away lying and speaking the truth to our neighbors. Then he says this in verse 26, he says, in your anger do not sin, let not the sin go down upon your wrath. He says a second 
thing we ought to do in terms of our spiritual adulting and being uh, mature in this walk. He says we need to control our anger. Don't nurse anger. Control your anger. You know, everybody experiences the emotion of anger. The difference between a believer and a non-believer should be that a believer does not nurse to anger. We don't have two, three, four, five day anger just hanging around uh, attached to us. We don't walk around angry for a year, two years, five years. Some of us tonight have been angry for a long time at one person, two persons, three persons, and we haven't dealt with that anger. We just kind of keep it in. And scripturally, Paul is saying, you're not supposed to let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't harbor anger. Don't nurse your anger is what Paul is saying. As a mature saint, you are not to nurse that emotion because if you do that, that anger will get the best of you and will cause you now to make decisions and to do things that is not Christ-like and can get you in trouble. Then he says this in verse 29, he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. What Paul is saying here in verse 29, he's saying now, as a mature saint, he says, in essence, Watch your conversation. As a mature saint, he's saying, in essence, be very careful in your communications and how you talk to people. The word corrupt in the Greek means cutting communication. So Paul is saying, in essence, don't use your tongue to cut people down. So many times things are said the wrong way. And when things are said the wrong way, people get hurt. When we communicate things improperly, we hurt people. And as a mature saint, Paul is saying that I should develop in the area of communication style. So even though I'm communicating something that I'm not pleased about, I can still do it in a way that's not going to damage the person who I'm talking to. And so what Paul is saying in essence is as a mature saint, as a, as a mature believer, he is saying, I have to learn how to be a good steward over my tongue. I just can't let my mouth just shoot off because I feel a certain way or I feel that I have been wronged or I feel I have to just get this off of my mind and get it off my heart. And so I'm just going to let it go. No, 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 no. I should be skilled and how I talk to you. I should be skilled in how I communicate how I feel towards you. If you hurt me, I should be skilled in how I communicate that hurt towards you in a way that I'm not cutting you up or tearing you down in the process. Then Paul says this, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. What Paul is saying is, as a mature saint, when it comes to spiritual adulting, watch your attitude. Watch your attitude. Watch your attitude. I can just stay right there for just a moment. Let that soak in. Watch your attitude. Some of us this evening know that our attitude towards our spouses, towards our children, towards others, is not Christ-like. But we feel that, you know, I'm feeling a certain way, and so I got a right to have a certain attitude. I heard a preacher say a while back, and it really blew my mind, and he's right. He says, we don't have a right to be right. As a Christian, we don't have a right to be right, even if we are right. What he was saying was, we don't have a right to uh, revenge ourselves. We don't have a right. 
Jesus says, that vengeance is mine. I shall repay, says the Lord. We I have a right to avenge ourselves. Bitterness, he says. Put away bitterness. Bitterness is eternal anger. Put away eternal anger. Some of us are bitter tonight. We're bitter and that anger has turned inward and it just makes us more bitter. He says, put away bitterness. He says, put away wrath. Wrath is nothing but anger acted out. It's just where you are just acting out, demonstrating your anger physically. That's what wrath is. He says, put away anger. Anger is just a mean emotion. It's a mean emotion where you just want to get payback for the wrong that's done to you. He says, put away clamor. Clamor is where you're being loud and you're ready to fight. You ever seen someone uh, clamorous? They just, they just all over the place. They're loud. They are uh, screaming and, and, and making a scene and they're just ready to fight. You got to hold them back because they're ready to just tear into somebody. That's clamor. And he says, speaking evil. Of course, speaking evil is nothing where you are releasing words and those words are being released to hurt somebody. The only reason that you're speaking those words is to hurt somebody. You're saying what you're saying because you want to hurt the person. And some of us know how to cut other people, especially in marriages. We know what to say to punch the button of another of our spouses. He says, when you do that, you're you're speaking evil. You should not say things that's going to just hurt your spouse, hurt other people, because you know that if you say it, it's going to hurt them. You want to hit back at them. You know you're not going to punch them with your fists, so I'm just going to punch them with my words. That's evil speaking. Anytime you speak something that you know is going to hurt another person intentionally, that is evil speaking. He says, put that away. And he says, malice. Malice is where you intentionally put down someone in front of someone else. You intentionally talk down to someone and you put them down and you make them feel bad or you belittle them in the eyes of other people who are present. That's malice. That's malice. Parents have to be very watchful of this because sometimes we think that because I'm the parent, and because I have the right to correct my child, and they did something wrong, a new nation have done something wrong, that you can just cut them down with your words in front of the other kids, in front of other people. I dare say that if you're going to correct that child correctly, that you take that child to the side and deal with that child, that child over to the side with the, the, the kids, the other kids, other siblings and everybody else don't see the correction or don't hear what you're saying so you're not belittling them in front of their brothers or their sisters or other people around them. And you say, well, Pastor, are you taking that to the stream? Well, no, scripturally, scripturally, that's how we are to parent. Not only that, we're not uh, correcting to hurt, we're correcting to teach. And so scripturally, we don't even have a right to correct the child until we teach them first. And, for, and so you're correcting them on something you never taught them how to do. So the way you uh, scripturally correct is first you teach them, you show them how to do something. And then you make sure they understood what you said. And so once you know that they understood what you told them to do, then if they come back and do it wrong, then you correct them. But if you just correct them because they didn't do something, they didn't know to do it right. That gets over in the area of abuse. How you feel somebody come and bump up on you because you didn't do something right. And you're thinking to yourself, well, I, I would have done it right as someone told me. No one told me how to do it. They jumping all over me and I didn't know. So now you feel abused and you have a right to feel abused because you have just been abused. Because no one really instructed you on how to do that thing right. And so because you've never been instructed on how to do it right, then correction really isn't um, uh, in line. What's in line first is instruction, then correction. Same thing here. He says malice. When you put down someone in front of somebody else, you're trying to make them look bad. You're trying to make them feel bad. He says put away that. Put that malice away. And then he says this as we get very close this out. 
He says in verse 32, he says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. He says, in essence, as a Christian, as a mature saint of God, he says, we are always to get things right with other people. We ought to get things right with other people. If you have something against someone else, you ought to get that right. You should not be holding on to that hurt, that disappointment, or that misunderstanding and not trying to get it right. That's not what mature saints do. Especially if someone comes to you and asks you if everything's okay, asks you, can we talk, can we get this thing right, or is, is there anything wrong, and no, I'm fine. And when you know it's not, you're not fine, when you know something's wrong, as a mature saint, you ought to get things right. The Greek word for forgive means release. We ought to release people Watch this now. This is not no new teaching class. We know this. We are to release people from the grip of our judgment. We are as mature saints. We are to release people from the grip of our own judgment. That's why he says again in verse 31, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. What is he saying? Get things right. This is what mature saints do. This is spiritual adulting is about getting things right, making sure things stay on the up and up, making sure that there's no ought against someone else, making sure that you release people from the grip of your judgment. Now, the Bible is for adults. <laughs> the Bible is for adults. The Word of God is for adults. What do I mean by that? I simply mean that when it comes to the Word of God and when it comes to being a believer, God expects us to, to mature and to grow up and to do it quickly. Now, I understand we have babes in Christ, but God does not want us staying babes for long because He wants us walking in this Word and in our walk, representing him in a mature way whereby we can go and help others mature in his word so they can go and make other disciples. This whole thing is about making disciples and being conformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. It's not about hearing a message and shouting, say that's a good word and going, no, it's about hearing the word of the Lord being taught, taking that teaching and applying it to your life whereby you grow to another level in God. And anytime you grow to another level in God, you're growing closer to God. And this is what it's supposed to be about, us growing closer and closer to Christ as we mature in the things of God. So Paul says, you know, I want you to come to that place where you are spiritually adulting. <laughs> That's what he's saying in essence. And he says, I'm giving you five things to do here as a believer. He says, you just speak the truth in love. He says, you ought to control your anger. He's saying in essence, watch your conversations, watch your attitude, and get things right with other people. This is how we ought to conduct ourselves as mature saints in our walk among those who don't know Jesus Christ, who have never accepted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Because this is how we help bring them into what we already know to be true. And that is Jesus Christ is Lord. And once you accept him as Lord, and once you receive and apply what he's saying through his word, you will see your life go from one level of growth to the next level of growth to the next level of growth. 
Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you tonight for this opportunity to share in your word. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our own individual walks. Father, we know that we ought to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But Father, we also know that it is your will and your desire, Father God, for us to mature in your word and to grow and to go out and to help others grow in your word that we might go from one level of glory to the next level of glory. Father, I pray this evening, Father God, that your people will receive this word and that they will apply this word to their daily walk, that they might see the fruit and the benefit of the word working in their lives. And I thank you for this, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. We look forward to ministering to you Sunday morning. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Praise God for that word. Amen. Well, it is now offering time, a time for you to worship the Lord in your giving. If you would, please turn with me over to 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, starting at the 10th verse. And uh, I am reminded of a, a time not too long ago, I was talking to my mother and uh, she was telling me that she was going to give my, my niece, who was in college, some money. And uh, first words on, out of my mouth is, she don't need no money. And uh, as soon as I heard those words, I thought about it, I said, why are you blocking this, this woman's blessing? Uh, my, my niece and, my, and my, uh, my mom. And my, before I can get it out, take it back, my mom said to me, that's the same thing her mama said, meaning my, my sister, my niece's uh, mom. And, uh, but in saying that, I knew in my heart of hearts that it was wrong. And uh, God blesses those who bless others. Over in 2 Corinthians, uh, the ninth chapter, starting the 10th verse, it says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Uh, verse 11, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Amen. You are blessed to be a blessing. Your giving not only blesses others, but also blesses you. Amen. But as a result of you blessing others, blessing the church, someone else can give thanksgiving to God. So I say to you at this time, pray about it. And if you decided in your heart what you're going to give uh, or you have already prepared your offering, I say stretch your hand toward the screen or you can lift your offering up. We're going to pray for it. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening. We thank you for the word that went forth, dear God. We thank you, dear God, for every person under the sound of my voice, dear God. We thank you for their obedience to your word, dear God. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for their desire to give to your house, to your kingdom. And I pray, dear God, according to your word, that they are blessed as a result, dear God. Dear God. I pray to God that you meet them at their point of need. I pray they lack no good thing in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I pray for Harvest Rain Church. I pray that they are blessed, Heavenly Father. They are enriched and do all that you've called them to do, dear God. I thank you for this provision to go forth with the vision, Heavenly Father. I thank you and I praise you in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Again, we thank you for tuning in. We ask that you tune in next time. But until then, you be blessed.